Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Well, it's lovely to be here this week. Um, I really was very poorly last week and I'm still, in, in all honesty, you know, trying to get through whatever's been going on. And, uh, you know, I feel with all those who are also carrying a bit of the, the bug, it's not nice, is it? Not nice at all. Horrible. Um, but I want to start by just, first of all, just um, saying a big thank you to Graham. I watched while I was tucked up in bed and um, I had a hot water bottle, which is so rare for me. I wasn't even sure whether that when I filled it, it wasn't going to burst or do something silly. So it must be 30 years old and, you know, not being used in a very long time. You know what I mean? And uh, anyway, it was all right. And I filled it with boiling water and laid in bed and I listened to uh, Graham. And it was very moving and I was very grateful for his words. And we have been so blessed to have the Grant family with us. And um, we are only, we are wishing them on their way, but they are not gone from us because they are part of us. And that is the spirit. And I am so very, very grateful for that. Um, but it was lovely just to hear and feel somebody who felt sad about leaving us. <laughs> it's nice that, isn't it? It's good. Um, the other thing I also want to say is, Thank you for everybody who's helped me. Dave Craven, I know that you're not here tonight and that's rare for you, but you're my partner in crime. We row like cat and dog. And I am the creative one and he is the structural engineer. And he tells me everything I can't do. And I look at him in the face and I'll say, we can! And he looks at me and says, well, yeah, but we have to do it this way or it will collapse. And I'll say, well, all right then. And so together, we built a rabbit hole. And uh, it has been quite good. And for everybody who's chipped in and these things, uh, you, you know, I'm not saying this to, you know, glorify myself. I'm just trying to tell you this stuff takes hours and hours of work just in the thought and preparation stage. And then, of course, you get to the next stage of the pulling it off, the gathering everything together. It's just like Narnia. And then, of course, it has to be done. And then it has to be cleared away. And it's like, Ma, what did we do? But I, I believe that God is part of our creativity in this house and we're touching people. I hate the word touching. We need a new word for touching. We, we are impacting people's lives because of our joy and our belief that the rabbit hole goes down very deep. I don't know about you lot, that, that's been massive for me, the matrix and, you know, we, we did it at Christmas, didn't we, at uh, Christmas, Easter, um, and we were talking about how deep the rabbit hole goes and we gave people an opportunity to take the, the red pill and I believe we're in a red pill reformation because people are not satisfied anymore with what's been handed down. And we have had some stuff handed down. You do know that, don't you? Handed down stuff. It's like clothes when we were younger. You know, you got your, your, your siblings who were older than you. you and, and nobody likes that. Have you thought about that? Nobody likes hand-me-downs. And yet when it comes to what we believe, we seem to swallow it easier. We fight the clothes. I'm not wearing that because that belonged to him or her or whatever. But we, f we just swallow some of this stuff that we've been handed. But we're learning that the rabbit hole goes deep. And uh, I haven't got very long tonight, so I don't even know whether I can cover all I wanted to say. I'm going to start here. I'm going to start here, right? 
I have loved the fact that Anne's been bringing over the last few weeks the, the, the message of the fruit of the Spirit. I think it's very, very important that we understand that uh, there has been a massive swing from wanting to focus, and I'm, I'm not saying this is what he said, but I'm, I'm, these, this is my words, right? Um, there's a massive swing from wanting to convert people into something, i.e., uh, you know, forever banging a drum about sin and about what you shouldn't do and how you should live and all this, that and the other, to actually understanding that our role is to live out the fruits of the Spirit. That's all that's required of us. That's all that's required. Be loving, be patient, be kind, be gentle, be long-suffering. And I'll tell you what, it's tough. Come on, be honest, it's tough. That's why when we do these things, it actually has some power. Because us lot, as human beings, it doesn't come natural. Get it? So when we believe that we have been transformed in the renewing of our mind by the, by the power of God, it's that we've, we've switched camp. So instead of wanting this, we say, no, there's a better way. Yeah? A better way. Now, I'm not telling you that, you know, it flows out of my ears. It doesn't. But I'll tell you what, it is true the older you get, somehow you learn. <laughs> You learn the hard way, don't you? Because you try it the other way and you realise that doesn't work. So you think, well, you know, I'll try something else. Anyway. So when Anthony was talking about the fruits of the Spirit, I was really thrilled about that because I'm thinking, yeah, this is it. This is what we need to be. And we need to actually be those things in this very crooked world. Let's do some straight lines of always deciding my straight line in all situations is to be kind is to be patient, is to be this, is to be that. Do you get me? We're going we're gonna to follow that. But what occurred to me was the issue of um, the hub. When he talked about Christ being the hub. Do you, get, you remember that? Right? Because, I mean, some weren't there, but I'm, it doesn't matter. It, it, it'll stand on its own. We're talking about the centre of the wheel, you know, the, 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 what do you call them? Spokes, being all these truths of the Spirit. But what keeps it totally... Uh, solid and secure is, is the hub and uh, it, the, the hub being Christ. Now, when Anthony was talking about that, it just, I mean, this is how it works. When Anthony said, you know, he doesn't pick what we preach on, he picks you. He did this a couple of weeks ago because I thought, yeah, I've got to talk about that because you see, the hub being Christ, that sounds totally obvious. The hub being Christ. But what does it mean, the hub being Christ? Because I know for me, for a very long time, the hub being Christ was Christ being the thing that saved me from God. So if you think of the circle of the wheel as being the, 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 the rim being God or whatever, and the, hub, the, the spokes are all these wonderful things, they're what please God once you've come to Christ, that's the hub that holds everything together, but basically... Christ is the one that saves me from God. And so that's a very different way of viewing things. Now, some of you have never heard, heard of that before, but this was, this was my view. So when we talk about Christ holding everything together, he holds it together because without him, I can't please God. Does that make sense? So we, I need Christ at the hub because without him there, I have no uh, acceptance before God. And um, when he started talking about it the other week in a very different way, I thought, wow, I like that. Because I don't want that idea. And um, what really came to me is um, that we have understood grace in a very unfortunate way. Because we've always seen grace as being, okay, Jesus is full of grace and truth, but it's the grace that he has that still stops God being angry with me rather than it being something else. Now, let, let, I'm, I'm sort of moving a bit ahead of myself. Can you just put the picture up and we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more and I'll have a drink. 
It's the one of Grace. Is it up there? Oh, yeah. I absolutely love this picture. But at the same time, I hate it. This is what I was brought up with. And it seems so awesome that you see the guy at this side or the woman. I know he's got trousers on, but it can be a woman if you want it to be. We're at this side of this cavern or this great abyss. And the other side, this, this tree, which is sort of representing the tree of life or God or whatever. And we can't get across. And ultimately, grace in the middle is what allows me to bridge that gap. Now, it all sounds very beautiful, but the point is this. It's a bit precarious. Have you looked at it? Just, just for a minute, start to think about even jump, getting across to the top of the G. And then from the, the, you know, the bit you go down to get onto the top of the R and look at the gap between the R and the A and the gap between the A and the C. Now, I know it's art and please don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to be unkind. It's beautiful. But what it suggests is that it's precarious. That somehow grace, which we're saying that is the hub of our, our, our Christianity, is what allows us to get to God, but do you know what? Anything could just hit it, a, 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 a blow of wind or whatever could blow different doctrine or something that would come along or, God forbid, we make a big mistake <laughs> and, you know, we, we fall and that grace suddenly comes tumbling down. Now, what I have really understood that that is my understanding of grace from a humanistic point of view, because that's how I, how I think. Okay, if somebody's upset me or there's a problem, I bridge the gap with some grace. And sometimes there is a bit of a gap and there's a bit, it's a bit, bit precarious. But I've actually allowed God to be that to me when it actually isn't the truth. And a few years ago, I preached about the fact that what Jesus did was not fill a gap. He actually obliterated the gap. Now that is what I now understand. So the hub, and I'm mixing metaphors here, of Christ being the hub is not anymore what holds, me to, holds things together in order that I might just please God by those fruits of the Spirit, love and kindness and whatnot. No, it, it, he is the one who holds it together because he himself is the personification of love and that love which he is allows me to operate in love which are the fruits of the spirit is that clear so I don't like that I like it as art but I don't get it in the context of the uh, of the understanding of it you see because what we have uh, our understanding becomes that Jesus is the grace of God that is given and so God has grace for us but in fact he doesn't have grace he is grace that is very very different do you get that he doesn't have grace he is grace. Now, I'm just going to give you something to think about. I always thought then that if God has grace, which is through the gift of Jesus to bridge the gap between my sinfulness and God, then Jesus becomes like a cloaking device that covers me so I can still be accepted. Does that make sense? But in my own self, I am still not accepted. Without that cloaking device of grace, I am still terrible. God forbid that that cloaking device moves because suddenly I'm exposed. Have you got me? You see the picture? So that cloaking device becomes very, again, precarious. Instead of actually, if God is grace, it means that it's an attitude that he is, not attitude that he has. It's an attitude, an essence of his being, which is this. And I'm just going to put it nicely for you. Grace is God's non-retributive attitude towards failure. 
Do you want me to say that again? Grace is God's non-retributive attitude towards failure. Isn't that amazing? And it's not something that he switches on when he feels like it. It's his default setting. It's who he is. Is that making sense? Fabulous. So for me now, you see, the hub, which is Christ, is not something that's saving me from something out there which I can't attain. It's something that's actually obliterated the gap. The gap can never appear just by some sudden earthquake. You know, it's not going to suddenly appear again and I'm going to need something. The gap is obliterated and I am totally at one with the Father. Now, I just think that's a lovely piece of information. Don't you? Right, next thing. Get rid of that. Let's put this next thing up. Anth was talking about this, and I thought this was interesting. Well, he wasn't talking about this. This is my idea. Sorry. He said, he was talking about um, how we know about the Spirit. And I, and I said this to him later on after he preached. Isn't it? interesting that um, when we talk about feeling spirit, what is it that we gravitate to? Be honest. It's negative. Always. You tend to feel the off, not the on. Think about it. Walk into a room. He said it. If a couple have been rowing like cat and dog, you walk into a room, you know it. And I love the illustration because it's right. You sense a spirit. It's a spirit of an attitude. But what I find interesting is that we rarely talk about it in the context. I walk into the room and people are laughing and happy. And we say, I felt the spirit. No, laughter, we just say, well, they were just having a bit of fun. It was the, we don't associate that with spirit. Have you got me? It's no, we only tend to associate spirit with demons. Stupid things. So this is my little addition to this talk. Look at this. The difference between a weed and a flower is a judgment. Now you might think, what's that got to do with anything? It's this. I remember my son used to call these, and the reason why I picked this picture, these had a name for him, and it was really weird, because how it came about was one of those really strange things that happen in families. Outside, down the thing down here, there was a load growing, and I picked one up, and I was doing the very bad thing of blowing it to just, you know, add a few more lovely dandelions to the, you know, and... um, I was talking to somebody else at the time, and as I blew it, I shouted, well, it's okay, the Lord is with us. From that moment on, they were called, the Lord is with us. That is the truth. I'm not making that up. Absolutely the truth. The Lord is with us. And for a little while, we were a bit confused because he would go and he'd pick up, you know, I'm talking about really young here. He'd pick one up and he'd say, Look, the Lord is with us. And at first we're thinking, what's he talking about? And then we understood that's why he'd he'd, he'd picked it up. Isn't that amazing? Now, I tell you that story because sometimes it helps to just, if we choose to believe that that, the Lord is with us, then the Lord is with us. Are you you seeing what I'm meaning? For him, the Lord, but to somebody else, the Lord isn't with us because it's full of blooming weed don't associate that with the Lord is with us because you're only filling my garden with a load of junk. See? But to him, the Lord is with us. And as he was blowing it, he figured that all those seeds were wonderful. And they were, and in essence, they are. Because the difference between a weed and a flower is a judgment. Now that is, I think that's a quite fascinating thing. And I want you to all get this now as I move on just to a, a, something that I said at the beginning. We all think that we understand the difference between good and evil. 
we think we get it. Chris, she thinks she gets it. She doesn't. So I'm not just pointing at you guys. We all think that we know the difference between good and evil. But in fact, at any point in our lives, anything that is happening can actually be the greatest epiphany of our lives, even though it appears in that moment as, as, as the most horrendous thing. And, and I know that's hard because the tree, right in the beginning of knowledge of, of good and evil, set us on this uh, track which somehow told us we know how to identify what's good and what is bad. We try and keep away from what is bad and what is good. But at the end of the day, you know, if God is working for our good in all things, it means that we can actually celebrate and say, do you know what? Even in this, the difference between a weed and a flower is a judgment. And what we are judging in these times is actually God. Now, I know this is hard to get your head round, but when we are judging a situation as to whether it is good or bad, we are actually judging God and we are saying, you're not here, you're not for me, or you are for me, or, do you get me? You're not for me. When actually we should be saying in every situation, you are for me, the last word has not been spoken, whatever happens, I know that I am your child and you are with me. Uh, do, do you see the difference? The judgment has gone, but we often fall into the judgment of what is good and what is bad. So... There was a phrase, we used this the other week in, in Wednesday night, and I wanted to bring it to you. Um, born again. Born again. Evangelical statement, right? We've all heard it before. You must be born again. And yet it's used in one occasion in the Bible to a guy who came to Jesus, and he said, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to this particular guy, you must be born again. The only time it's used, isn't it funny, once. And then all of a sudden we've made a, a, doctrine, a doctrine of it and we've, you know, said everybody has to come this particular way. Another guy comes to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He says, go and sell everything you have. Oh, don't like that one. I like they must be born again. Let's be born again. That's much better. I like that one. So, evangelicals, let's all be born again. Because I'll tell you what, if we have to sell everything we have, it's going to be hard, isn't it? I'm not trying to be facetious, but I'm just trying to bring it to you. So, what am I trying to say? This is what happens. We get stuck with this being born again. But you know what? I understood just a couple of weeks ago on a Wednesday night, we had a wonderful time week last Wednesday in the back. And people were talking about things that they have been born to in their lives. Some things that they have not chosen, things that have happened, that has shaped them, that has formed them, and things that we very recognize very clearly is not wholesome particularly, but this is just how we're made up. And suddenly it dawned on me that when Jesus was saying, you must be born again, what really that means, it's not this idea of, you know, uh, weeping and repenting and being sorry for all this, that and the other and somehow being a, 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 a butterfly coming out of a, a caterpillar per se, but it's just to say, do you know what? This is what has defined me up to this point but now I am willing to be defined by something else. And you know what? You are going to have to be born again, again and again and again and again. Because if we're not careful, we can end up, me, I'm coming up 59 at the end of this month. And the truth is, if I'm not careful, I cannot be born again in some issues that are destructive to my life. Do you get me? And I'm saying it to all of you, you've, there's never not an opportunity to say, do you know what, I've, I've carried this baggage. I'm going to be born again today. Yeah? And so this is the, the thing that I wrote down. Um, what we need to be born again to 
And I like the word born again if we use the word awakened. Because when you're born, you wake up, don't you? Suddenly you've been in this, you know, you wake up. It's this. is the fundamental truth that we are beautiful, worthy, and loved just as we are. Shall I say that again? That being born again, what we need to understand, we are born again too, is the fundamental truth that we're beautiful, worthy, loved, just as we are. Now, we have this, uh, I'm going to try and find something in here because I want to quickly read it. I know we're running out of a bit of time. Um, find it on here. There's another statement that's quite... Um, uh, common. Is it, is it that one? And it's this. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Oh, I found it. Um, the phrase, a personal relationship with God. And I've been reared with it. But you know, what I've realized is that it ends up being as much of a law dominated concept as anything else because suddenly we think yeah but what does it mean to have a personal relationship with God what does that look like what should I be doing well you know so-and-so gets up every morning at six o'clock and prays and therefore does that mean I have to get up every morning at six o'clock and pray somebody else doesn't do this does that mean I shouldn't be doing that and are you following me because it becomes uh, uh, this incredible difficult thing to figure out what we must do in order to have this personal relationship with God. I mean, I find it really funny because for me, I think, well, how do I have a personal relationship with Anth? I mean, I'm thinking about that all the time. And some of you have been married 40 odd years. You're asking the same questions, aren't you? How do we have good relationships with our partners? Now, that doesn't mean to say that we haven't got things good, but it's because you you're always asking questions. What do we do? Are you with me? And, and isn't it tough? Come on, be honest. Isn't it tough? Then suddenly we apply that same principle to the God of creation and we've made him into a humanistic form that we're trying to figure, oh, I'll tell you what, if I do this, he'll be happy. We're back to the, the spokes of the wheel have you got me? Oh, Christ is the hub, but each of the spokes of the fruit of the Spirit are keeping God happy. No, they're not. They come out of, they are a byproduct of what we do because we have understood the love that God has for us. It's not what we must do to keep God happy. So listen, I want to read this and I know I'm running out of time. All that stuff that I gave you back there, we ain't doing, I don't think now, so forget it, guys. So we're running out of time, but look at this. Religion gets people all worked up over the idea of cultivating a better relationship with God. But what they most need, are you all listening, is a healthier relationship with themselves. <gasps> People are suffering every day, not because of a def deficient relationship with the deity in the sky, but because of a dysfunctional relationship with the person in the mirror. Cultivating a new relationship with yourself could include things like, and I could read them and I don't really want to because I wasn't going to get into what you need to do to cultivate a better relationship with yourself. I want to use the point that most of the time when we're screaming out for a better relationship with God, it's because you're disconnected from who you are. And if you know who you are, worthy, loved, just as you are, like I said a minute ago, fundamental truth, beautiful, worthy, loved, you will not have a problem looking at your face in the mirror. I call myself at this time a lollipop. Um, 
it's our little in joke in the family. Because if I take my shirt off, which you do not want me to do, it's really been funny that over the years I have, I have got a shape that's like my dad. <laughs> it's funny. And I call myself a lollipop because I've got very skinny legs. But I'm getting bigger sort of up here. And yet it's just like a lollipop. And No, but listen, I, I know you must think I'm being really strange tonight, but I'm just trying to help you. But when I look in the mirror, the shape that I see, although I'd like to change it, don't get me wrong, <laughs> I'd like to have a magic wand. <laughs> I can't. But you know, I don't look in the mirror and think, you are unworthy, ugly, and unloved. I say, you might look like a lollipop chappy, but you're beautiful, you're worthy, and you're loved. Now, you, some of you think I'm being facetious because some of you really struggle with uh, self-image problems. But seriously, I'm trying to get you to understand that there's something beyond that that gives us a sense of, it's okay, it's all right. Can I have just five more minutes, do you think? Right, I might just show you those things, right? Right, let's put the first serenity prayer. Who knows the serenity prayer? <laughs> God grant me, let's say it together, the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. My lollipop, yeah? Lollipop. Um, that I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Now, I've learned something. I thought the serenity prayer was written by Francis of Assisi, but it wasn't. It's this man here, Reinhold Niebuhr. There you go. Did you know that? I didn't, but the serenity prayer is quite knowledge. You know, people know it, don't they? Do you know what's really interesting? What, um, what serenity means? Tranquil, calm, peaceful, untroubled. Oh, how many of us here are untroubled? Uh. Most of the time we really are trying to change the things we cannot change. And the courage to leave myself alone in one sense, so I'll just try and change everybody else, but you know. And wisdom, I don't know. It's, we're back to the thing of the weed, aren't we? Be honest, the difference between uh, a weed and a flower is a judgment. So sometimes in this situation here, the things I cannot change and the things I can change, we struggle because we're dealing sometimes with, a, with what we think is a weed and we might actually be digging up a flower. Are you with me? Sometimes it's a little bit more complicated. But anyway, I thought we'd just have a bit of fun for a minute. Is that okay? So I'm going to do some alternatives, and I think Beals will speak to you more than that. That's the good version. Give me another one. Come on, put another one up. Look at this. God grant me the serenity. I've got to be untroubled, right? Peaceful, untroubled. To stop beating myself for not doing things perfectly. Hello? I could point at you. I'm not going to. Okay. For not doing things perfectly, the courage to forgive myself because I'm working on doing better. Oh, isn't that lovely? Like that. And the wisdom to know that you already love me just the way I am. If you want a copy, I'll send it to you. I've got it on my phone. That's a nice one, isn't it? Who wants that one? Come on, who wants that one? Come on. Right, next, please. I like this. God grant me the serenity to accept the people I cannot change, the courage to change the one I can, and the wisdom to know it's... Whoa! All right. Uh, I like this. Author unknown variation. <laughs> I like that. He should have been more known than the other guy, don't you think? Right, moving on. I like this one. Lord, grant me the serenity to accept stupid people. 
the way they are, courage to maintain my self-control and the wisdom to know that if I act on it, I'll go to jail. <laughs> Sorry. That made me laugh because I wondered how many times we just didn't do things because I might just go to jail. <laughs> Sorry, that shows what's in me, doesn't it? <laughs> right, I like that. And I like the fact that it's grumpy. Shut up, I'm still talking. I like that. Okay, another one. And I love this. This is for you wonderful young older people, okay? Go grant me the senility. Not serenity, but we'll, we can have that as well. To forget those people I never liked anyway. <laughs> the good fortune to run into those I do like, and the eyesight to tell the difference. <laughs> Amen. And I think, do we have one more? Or is that it? Oh, and I, I love this one. Lord, grant me the serenity. Remember, I've got to be untroubled, peaceful, calm, to accept the messy state of my, that my house is in, the courage to start cleaning, and the wisdom to not let you get this way again. <laughs> See, what I've done here, all I wanted to do was put it into some normal language. See, sometimes this is what the Bible fails to do for this modern generation. Put it in language we understand. Yeah? Is any of this resonating with you? Okay. Next. And shut your eyes, all those people will be offended with this one. This is for all you women who are struggling. God, grant me the serenity to accept the man I cannot change, the courage to change his ways when I can, and the wisdom to know he's not trying to me off on purpose. Yes, he does, it works. Shall I read it the other way around? Would that help? Yes. God, grant me the serenity to accept the woman. I cannot change, the courage to change her ways when I can and the wisdom to know she's not trying to annoy me on purpose. Fruits of the Spirit. Fruits of the Spirit. Just want it to become modern language to us. Fruits of the Spirit. The hub is Christ, but, the, but Christ is not keeping you okay with God. There is no gap. There is no problem. But the spokes are not what we do to please him. It's what comes out of us because we are at one with him. Do you understand? Okay. I think I'm about done. Is there anything else I need to say? Um, yeah. The, le the greatest lesson that I think I have ever learned in all my life, and, and I've been brought up in religion, so to speak, in, in, in church. I've not known anything else. But the greatest lesson I have learned is that all my great attempts to please God, while not understanding what really it meant to be in relationship with you guys and also with myself, it was actually a big farce. So you can stand in church, you can have your hands in the air and you can be singing wonderful songs, but at the end of the day, I believe now so much that I am worshipping God when I'm at peace with me and I'm at peace with my neighbours. And that becomes worship to God. Because God isn't out there, he's in here, and as I am living and breathing, he is being one with me and I am one with him. And that's why we need the, the wheel to have point of contact with the ground, the hub being Christ, that wonderful personification of love, not, not a sacrifice that appeases God, but it's the, the wonderful personification of love that actually allows all those fruits of the spirits to uh, flow from us. So I'm going to leave it there. I hope that's helped tonight. And uh, if you want any of these serenity prayers, you can come and get them from me. 
All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay. I have made it very public that I've thought a lot about things like prayer. And uh, my ethos in prayer now is not what are my words saying to God, but what are my words saying about God? Because we can have a way of praying that, that sounds a certain way, but actually if we analyse it, what it's saying about God is God is reluctant, God withholds himself, God's not helpful, because we're asking him to do things he's already done. Now, I think the greatest legitimate prayer you can ever pray is, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. The most powerful prayer I ever prayed was at the darkest moment in my life when you suddenly realize that you splurred out all these words when you were just in normality and then the rubber hits the road and you are, you are staring down the barrel of a gun. You are looking disaster in the face. You don't know how this is going to work out. And I prayed the most powerful prayer that I've ever prayed in all my life. And I've been in church since the week I was born until now. So I've heard, I've heard them all. I've prayed them all. I've repeated them all. I've prayed in King James English, modern English, I've, with rich people, poor people, nationalities, done it all, but the most powerful prayer I ever prayed in, in my life was that moment. And my prayer was this, Lord, help me, I don't know what to do. And uh, do you know what? He hears our prayer, he hears our cry. And uh, because we're already accepted and loved and how God sees us, actually, if we would just settle into that, our Riley's most common thing to me now is, will you help me, Grandad? It's the most common request. Will you help me, Grandad? Now, it's usually some game on the iPad that I haven't a clue what I'm supposed to be doing. And uh, no matter how much I tell him I can't help you, he doesn't believe that there's any possibility that I can't help him. Because his view of me is, Grandad can help me and I need help. Now, I can't help him, but let me tell you something. In the game of life, in all the stuff we get locked into where we don't know what to do, our prayer to God, God help me, is a lot more powerful than Riley's prayer to Grandad, Grandad help me, because he does know what to do, and he's ready to do it, and in fact, most of it is already done before you ever said, Lord, help me. It's already done and ready for you to walk into. So I want you to receive that and embrace that tonight on the back of all that Chris has said. Father, right now I pray. Lord, help me. I thank you that you hear the echo from every heart right now. I know there's many hearts that are saying to you in the middle of so many trials, Lord, help me. Thank you that you've already gone ahead of us. You've already prepared a way. And that our Lord, help me, releases us into a dimension where we are allowing you to be who you are because we have said, I can't fix this. I'm not the answer to this, but I know who can and I know who is, and that's you. So Lord, as I pray, Lord, help me. I release that for so many hearts and lives in this house. And thank you that you said before they call... I will answer. Thank you for, that at the speed of spirit right now, there is an answer coming for people who've cried that today. Supernatural revelation this week that you already heard before we called and that the answer is already prepared and on its way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. Then why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.